Hello, everybody. Welcome to episode five of the Realtors Roundtable. Today, we are honored to have Michael Phillips. Some of some people would know Mike as the baseball coach. Some would know him as a football coach. Someone would know him as the realtor. I know Mike as the person who has really changed Dearborn real estate uh, for the better good. Uh, so, Mike, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me, Nam. It's an honor. My question, so I've known you since for a very long time, since I was about 10 years old. When I was 10 years old, do you did you envision us one day uh, sitting in the morning at 8 a.m. brainstorming about the market and business and life and then working together and then being on a podcast? I mean, I, I'm honestly, I can't say that I didn't because I, I always had some type of connection towards you and I feel that was really you know, for the love that I had, like for your dad and for your uncles and for your family. Um, so just naturally, the love that they showed me and the care that they showed for me, I automatically, like, I wanted to do the same for you. Yeah. And not knowing that and exactly how it was going to lead and lead us into to business. But I do I do know that I had just kind of like an inherited, inherited uh, duty to help you and to love you and to kind of like care about you and make sure you're on the right track. Thank you. Uh, the feelings mutual. That, that's one of the things that I love about Dearborn, and that's what we do for each other. For sure, for sure. The feelings mutual. Yeah, thank you. Much appreciated. So, <clears throat> going back ten years, I don't know if you remember, but the day after my last football game, I got two calls. I don't know if you remember the phone call. So I got two calls. I was very upset because I ended up leaving in the middle of the season, and we're like a really big football family. Right. So I got one call from my cousin Yusuf, Jomo Salam, who's a superintendent of Crestwood. In both of these calls I received, I was still sleeping. So I took both of these calls from my room. You and uh, Jomo Salam and you. Do you remember your phone call? I don't. You don't? No. I, I think I remember making the call. I don't remember exactly what I said to you. So you called me, and you told me, hey, look, at the end of the day, like football, it's great, it's awesome, it's a great memory, but it's not the end of the world. And like when you play your last football game after playing like eight years old to 18, like you think it's the end of the world. So I sure. thought, you know, like life's over, everything else is pointless. And you told me, life is just starting, it's all good, it's not that serious. And you told me, one day if I open a business, you're going to work with me. You don't remember that? I don't. And I'm thinking, like, this guy's a real estate agent. What's my going to open, like, a sandwich shop? Like, and I'm going to be, like, making – like, I couldn't envision it. And I was, like, so upset at the time. I'm thinking, like, thanks, Mike. Yeah, you're going to open a business, and I'm going to work there. Sounds great. And it really happened. You know, and I, I don't remember that exactly. But when I look back at it, I, and a lot of the things that led us to where we're at today, like, I always tell people, like, God had a hand in it, mm -hmm. and like like God was prepping me at that time to be where I'm at today, and and so like when I when I hear that story and I reflect on it, it just reemphasizes that point that like God was telling me to make these calls and reach out to the people that I knew I loved and the people that I believed in, mm -hmm. and and that I had a mission and a purpose to do what I, we did here at Legacy. So I just it's you know I, I love hearing that story. Thank you because it it reemphasizes that everything we've done, God's had His hand in it and He's guided guided us together 100 and the best part about that story is shows what a good person you are because you even called me was that before or after i because i took your car to prom and i hit it yeah i backed into someone's car and i remember like man how do i tell this guy this guy gave me his range over for his prom i backed into someone's car so i texted you and i said hey mike Look, man, whatever it's going to cost, I'll pay for it. I don't know how I would have paid for it. But I said, you know, I'll, I'll work the car wash on the weekend. I'll pay for it. But uh, And you still opened a business and let me and let me yeah, work with you. I wasn't even upset at you. You were. Me, I made a million mistakes. I don't see. I, I actually have a saying. So a couple things. One, it's, uh, you know, we make mistakes. God doesn't. Right. You know, so like, yo, whatever, if that was what Allah wanted to intend for that day, like, it's okay. My mm -hmm. duty is still to show you love and to just teach, you know, teach you through it and coach you through it. And that's what we do. And and that falls alignment to it. Like, you, I'm sure you're familiar with my value system. It's love, trust, loyalty. Mm -hmm. You know, if I know you're somebody that I love and, and somebody we have trust for each other and we're, lo we're loyal to each other, we'll make all kinds of mistakes, but like we can work through it. For sure. Once you break any of those three of like in my value system, and then that's when it's, when it's a deal breaker and I really can't work with you anymore. 100%. 100%. It's easy to, it's hard to gain those things, love, trust, and loyalty, but it's easy to, within a stamp of a finger, right. you can lose and, that. And then when you know, when you consider your per yourself a person of value, 
I know I would bring a lot of value to relationships. You know, the number one thing I love doing in life is helping people and provide value to them. As long as we have that value system uh, connectivity and it doesn't get broken, then I'm going to give all I can to a relationship. Once somebody proves to me that they, there's no love, there's no trust, or they're not loyal, then we just move on. You know, they can move on in their direction in life, and I'm going to stick to the people that I have that connection and bond with. 100%. And how I look at it is if someone shows you that they are that type of person, don't get upset about it. Just understand that that's just how they are. For sure. You know, you can, a lot of people, they get disappointed by someone and they're mad at them. And then the person's nice. And then they say, you know what? Uh, I'm just going to step back. And maybe they're, they're nice now. But at the end of the day, you know, this person has this type of tendency. Just understand. That's just how they operate. It's not personal. That's how they operate. So, you know. If they do it again, just expect it. And you don't really, you don't have to be best friends with this person. You don't have to uh, get upset if they do it again. Just understand, you know, I operate a certain way and you operate a certain way and that's it. You get, you you know, as as we grow into our older days, you know, on this planet, you start having, um, I have a vision that I always see. And it's like, just as the earth spins and the earth spins around the sun and the spot sun and, and the solar system spins around in the galaxy, like every single day of our lives, the earth is turning, we're turning. We People come into that circle and they'll mix with you mm -hmm. for a certain period of time. And then they'll also fall out. And you got to be okay with that. You know, initially, especially with us coming out of high school, like we have that group and that clique of friends that we're with. And, you know, when people start moving in their own directions, we don't know how to handle that at that age. And we're like, man, this guy changed or that one changed. And I don't see that one no more. And, 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 and back then you feel like something's wrong. But then later, as you go through life, you ought to get, learn to understand, like, God is going to bring certain people into my life for certain reasons, lessons. And they can be people like, inshallah, us, we stay together forever. And we stay in a great relationship with us forever. And then certain others are going to come in and they're going to also teach us lessons. And we got to let them go. Right. And let them fall out of that circle and let them go and become more okay with that. Yeah. So, but when you do, and, you know, going back to the reason why we have value systems is because the ones you want to stay either in business with or in life with, for that matter, are the ones who match your value system. 100%. Because when you when you have an alignment of values, that's when people, not just you yourself, can live a fulfilled life, but a group of people can come together, a community, a common culture, shared values, shared missions, and do really incredible and special things. You know That's what I believe we've done here at KW Legacy. We have. And you start seeing it when you look around to other brokerages and other communities they have their own kind of culture and value system and then everyone starts flocking into the direction of like okay well who do i like to be around with right where what type of environment do i like to surround myself in and that's if, if people were to ask me like tell me mike what are some of the most special things that were created through kw legacy i always speak on this number one first and foremost it's the culture of the people that we have the environment that we have when my clients or your clients come into into legacy and they're like man it just it feels great here yeah. like i've had so many of my clients say i wish i could work here i want to work here and to me that means the world that's and how that, we got 185 agents in a sure. year for sure question mike yes going back for those who don't know mike where did it all start yeah, so I'll just briefly, you know, my, my life story is very interesting. A lot of things happened to me that, like, I can talk about forever, but I'll just, in a nutshell, I was born and raised in the south end of Dearborn. You know, I like to say that, you know, I am what Dearborn is. My dad's family moved to the south end of Dearborn for his father to, from North Carolina to work at the Ford Rouge plant. My mom's family immigrated from Lebanon to, to, to the south end of Dearborn to work at the Ford Rouge plant as well. So, you know, I'm half Lebanese and I'm half mix, you know, Scottish, Irish, uh, American mix. And pretty much that's exactly what Dearborn is. You know, Dearborn, you have your combination of, the you know, obviously the Middle Eastern population and a deep rooted, you know, uh, population of you know mixed uh, european uh races if you will so that, that's basically what i am grew up in the south end of dearborn absolutely loved it uh in D dearborn as uh south end of dearborn in particular very strong tight-knit community nobody locked the doors you know next door to my house was my aunt or my cousin and and whoever and we all took care of each other and looked after each other uh in the south end of dearborn i, I was taught and i was learned exactly that Take care of each other, protect each other, support each other, 
love each other. And as hard as we were even on each other at certain times when we would leave the South End, we were one. And to the day that fraternity still lives on. So I went to Salina, uh, a, a, a very strong like uh, cultural awakening, if you will, for me. As we, we, I was part of the first group at Salina that got bust uh, from, from eighth grade. Uh, they shut down Salina Middle School and they bust us to Stout. And back then, that was like a huge deal. That was like, you know, remember the Titans. Like there was a huge coming together. And, and me and a few of my friends, we were the first group that before school even started because we played football, we had to come and meet the, you know, our, our new classmates mm -hmm. over there. And it was a very tense situation. I remember there was like 20 of their parents lined up. They wanted to see who these it's kids like, remember were. remember the Titans. Yeah. They wanted to see who these Arab kids were coming from the South End and uh, it really, a special story just like that too. We ended up going 5-0 and and undefeated and we came together. And But it, it was kind of a culture shock because in the South End and in Salina, like I was one of the only like white kids, you know, and even though I'm of Middle Eastern descent, I was the only one that kind of like looked white. Yeah. And so then going to Stout, we kind of like merged that. Uh, it was a great learning experience. From there on to Fortson, uh, uh, Fortson, I, I was, uh, you know, heavily into uh, athletics, football, basketball uh, were my passions. I ended up getting a scholarship to Grand Valley State University to play football for Coach Brian Kelly. Yeah, which a who, lot of people don't know who Brian Kelly is. Yeah. What's the story of Grand Valley for those who don't know it? So I actually uh, broke my neck in the high school all-star game. At that time, initially, I didn't know it was broken. So I went and reported to Grand Valley, and I knew something was wrong with my neck because I had no movement in my right triceps or right chest. And I, I tried working out and all that, but they knew, like, I had my arm was clutched to my side. It wouldn't move. They knew something was wrong with me. Uh, ended up getting sent to U of M Ann Arbor where they found two fractures in my neck. Wow. I needed to have surgery right away. When that happened, Coach Kelly, because he actually seen me – you know, dig in and try to work with the broken neck and try to, you know, play. He just gained so much love and respect for me. I believe he uh, he gave me a job working for him. You know, I was in charge of right after I had my surgery, I would set up the football practice field and, and I would get paid. And on the sideline, I would hold his extension cord at the time. It wasn't cordless and follow him up and down the sideline. For those who don't know, Brian Kelly, in my opinion, is top three coaches in America <laughs> right now. He's like, he yeah. coaches LSU, Death Valley, I mean, you could have maybe followed him. Yeah, so he offered me that, actually. And I, I tell people this story all the time. So when, when I, I after my surgery, they, the U of M surgeons told me, like, hey, you, your neck is fused. It's not going to break again. You have fusion of C5, 6, 7 in your vertebrae. You can play football again. And my parents were all like, yes, you're playing, you know. And me, I was a little bit nervous because, and I knew I was going to hit with my head again. That's yeah. the only way I knew how That's to hit. That's old school That's how way. we were taught back right. then, like just lead with your head. Which is wrong and just now. the harder wow. you can hit someone with your head, and the harder the hit and the yeah. better the hit. So uh, I went through the whole spring training process. I was lifting. I was gaining weight. I was getting faster. I was excited to play. Prior to getting spring uniform, the doctors called me down and they said, listen, Mike, are you sure you want to do this? Like you had a serious injury. Are you sure you want to do it? And and I was scared. I'm going to be honest with you. I, I, I was really, you know, worried. And they kind of talked me out of playing. So I called my mom and dad. Funny story. I was looking for some compassion from my mom and dad. They went off on me. They were so pissed at me that I wasn't going to play. And I just told them, like, you know, I'm sorry. Like my, my neck was broke. Like, I, yeah. I, you know, I, I'm going to hit with my head again. I'm just not going to do it anymore. So I went to to tell Coach Kelly that, touching back on the story that you told me why I called you, because when I went and told Coach Kelly that I wasn't going to play anymore, I started crying. Yeah. Like it was just, we don't know anything else but football right. in our life. Like what's what's left in this world? So when I did that, he told me, he said, Mike, don't leave me. He's like, stay here with me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep you a job. Don't leave. And I told him, okay, Coach, I won't. And that's the last time I ever spoke to him. I was gone. No, this guy's worth, yeah. his guy makes $20 yeah. million dollars a year. But alhamdulillah, again, I said, we make mistakes, God doesn't. Yeah. So like, you know, look where I'm at today. I wouldn't yeah. trade that even if I was his right-hand man or an assistant. I would not trade it for where I'm at today because, you know, where, what, what are, where I'm at today and what I accomplished today and what I believe is the gift that I had a hand in giving back to this city and KW Legacy means more than anything in the world. Like that was my mission. Yeah. And so, you know, I ended up coming back home. I always had entrepreneurial spirit in me since I was little. Like in the South End, I would shovel s snow for the neighbors. I would cut grass. 
my dad was a corrections officer, you know, corrections, they don't make too much money. And my mom was a stay at home mom. But, you know, I love my parents for every dollar they had. They did. They did. You know, me and my, my brother and sisters, we never felt want. So like, you know, but I always knew like, hey, I'm the oldest boy of this family. I got to do something. I got to help my parents. I got to help my parents. So I was always into working or finding ways to generate income. So when I came back, um, I had worked for Patrick Ellison at some in LA, you know, for quite some time. And Pat is a Pat is a great man of Dearborn too, who I don't think gets enough credit that he deserves because he employed a lot so of people many of still us. work for a lot yeah. of people. I mean, you so, pull up to so, these weddings. So I, so I love Pat, and, and you know, at that time though, again looking back on, I just had this entrepreneurial spirit where I always thought like, if he can do it, I can do it. So like, if I could see he can pick up you know lots and run a valet company, like I could do the same. Yeah. So I started just, you know, I, I, I looked into getting insurance on lots and how does that work at 18 years old? And then I started going to the, you know, bars and restaurants and trying, presenting myself like, hey, you know, do you need valet? And I'd like to have this account. And so I picked up a few accounts and, you know, I started running some valet lots. And back then, you know, I was making, you know, I would work probably five of the seven nights per week myself at some of the lots. And, and I was making maybe like at 18, 19 years old, a couple thousand dollars a week, cash money. So I became like the cool guy and had all this entourage of friends and uh, made just made a, a shitload of mistakes like from 18 to 30 years old that you know kind of I felt were priming me. I needed to get them out of my system. Money mistakes, uh, decisions mistakes, you know, drinking, partying, drugs, on and on and on. I just like needed to get it out of my system. I was always the guy like if my parents told me like, don't do this. Like I'm gonna want to find out why. Yeah. Like why did you tell me not to do it? I want I want to learn it on my on my own. That's just that's just the way I was, you know, for better or for worse. And so I, I made all kinds of mistakes. One of the, the best things I did at that time was I got married at 21 years old. I had my first son, Stephen, at 21. Two years later, I had Mikey at 23. So now I'm a 23-year-old, you know, I'm self-employed, you know, valet lot owner uh, with, with two children. And, you know, I used to work in the lots and, and school, by the way, too. Uh, you know, I, I'm 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 all about education. You know me. I love reading. I love learning. And learning today with, with the technology we have, it's at your fingertips. And I've gained a huge appreciation for books. My later my later days in life, but at that young age, like I didn't have time for school. Like I needed to make money. I wanted to make money. That was the only thing on my mind. So um, it, when I was working in those lots, I was like, man, what what's out there for me that I can do? that like I don't have to go back to school and get a degree for and then it was real estate yeah like 40 hours 40 credit hours get your real estate license because you know I knew in the lots like there's something bigger out there better for me so I went and got my license at 25 years old started in the real estate industry you know I would uh I would learn real estate during the day and then park cars at night and I did that for about you know three to five years it was I think four years which company did you start at uh, real Estate One. Okay. I started at Real Estate One in 1999. I remember Janice Spiro was the manager there. I, I came. I told her, hey, I passed my exam. She said, awesome. You're ready for training. I told her, I don't need training. <laughs> I'm ready to go. And actually, the, for my first day out, I wrote an offer and sold a home on my first day. Wow. So, you know, I, I just I got off to a really good start in real estate there with Janice. And uh, like I said, I, at about four years in, I out, and then one year later, I started getting recruited by the Remaxes. I went and worked at Remax Team 2000 with uh, for Eddie Mailed, uh, and I, and I would still I would do that, and then I would park cars at night. I was very, very linked, especially because I had you know a family. I had a house payment. I had children that I needed that consistent income through parking cars at night before I can go full into real estate alone. And about four years in, I thought I could do that. However, I haven't. I didn't learn the money management skills that I have today to to actually have made the right decision. Yeah. I gave up the, the valet parking business. I went real estate only. Would you then, have changed that if you if you can go back? Would you have kept the business maybe delegated? I tried to. Yeah. I, you know, I tried to like let my, my brother take over and it, it just didn't work because you build the relationships with those business owners. Right. And if it's not you and you, you don't have that relationship, then they kind of don't want to keep anyone else. Right. So uh, I, I tried that, it just yeah. it didn't work. Knowing what I know now about business building and building a business that can use the head model and a system that could be handed off to somebody, right. that would have been great. What would you, so for a business person who is afraid of, you know, giving up their business, but they can't be there all the time because that's a problem a lot of people have right now. What advice would you have given your old self about keeping those accounts or what would you have changed delegating wise, growth wise? 
you, you have to make yourself replaceable. See, one of the, the, the huge issues that we, we have is we always feel that like, no, nobody can do it better than me, so I have to do it myself. Right. And essentially, when you have that mindset, you're an employee, you're not a business owner. So to, to be an incredible business owner, you have to find and seek talent better than you. Right. I remember when I, when I was talking to KW about coming to KW and I met a mega agent who, who does, didn't go on his listing appointments anymore. I'm like, how, I don't understand. How do people call you to sell their home and you don't go? He's like, I find someone better than me. And my response at that time is, well, nobody's better than me. You know, but really you have to be, if you want to be a great business owner and a great leader, you have to find and develop talent better than you. And you have to drop the ego and thinking nobody's better than you because they're always, always somebody better than you. And the desire for that too, I'll just say, I'll speak on from me to you. My, my duty and my passion, if you will, as a leader is to create and to help you become way better than me. Yeah. And you're on that path actually. And that makes me really proud every single day. So, so like that's, that's how you create a business. You, you find and identify the talent that's better than you and then let them know how valued they are and where they feel they're incentivized to run that business as if, as, if, as if it's their own. That's one thing I wanted to get to is some of the things that Legacy brought and uh, Color Williams brought. There's one of two things that I wanted to ask you. Um, but before we go there, as a real estate agent, you were a top real estate agent for 20 years. Uh, I always said if I wasn't a real estate agent, I would hire Mike. Thank you. Mike could be my real estate agent. What do you think separates a good real estate agent from a uh, average real estate agent? Uh, for, first and foremost, it's going to be their ethics and their integrity. See, we, we have a lot of opportunities. Like we get calls to go on listing appointments. We love investing in real estate ourselves. So every appointment that I go on, I'm not only just a top tier listing professional. I'm also a real estate investor. So and, and as you're going through in transactions, opportunities are going to come up where my best personal interest might have an opportunity to take hold over my clients. If you want to be an outstanding real estate professional, you are never going to let that compromise your decision making. And you're only always going to take care of your client first and foremost. I always say this when we get our real estate license, it says real estate salespersons. It should say real estate service provider not salesperson, because we're not selling shoes or a piece of jewelry that you don't need or clothes. We're actually selling an asset, one of the greatest assets that our clients are ever going to invest in. And that home and or investment property, whichever they're, they're going into real estate for, that home, that investment is going to be the one that's ultimately going to link to them, and then they're going to want to buy it. We're just providing service. Now, there's two types of individuals in our industry. They're salespeople and they're service providers. And I'm not going to be one to tell you what to be. I'll tell you who I am. I'm a service provider. I know if I provide outstanding service, then the money's going to follow. There's a lot of other individuals in our business that they're strictly numbers and it's sales, 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 sales. They're going to work towards, I want to get as many sales I can with the impact that I have on the people who are hiring me is kind of secondary. My sales come first. I believe if you take the service provider approach, you're going to live the most incredible life through real estate and you're going to last as long as you want to last. And you're going to create a business that can be handed down to others because if you the people who love you and hire you know that what you did for them, if you tell them, hey, John's going to be on the appointment and is going to show up, I'm not going to be there, but this is one of my people, they're going to fully believe, trust, and value you. 100%. If you're a salesperson, they're not. Because they can feel it. You know, we yeah. talk about commission breath. They can feel yeah. that the only thing you care about is the sale and I don't trust that person and you're throwing somebody to me. Yeah. But when they know that you love them and you take them first and foremost, you're good. Right. And you can build that big business. So be a service provider, not a salesperson. One. Two, communication. Uh, a lot of people get into this industry, like I said, 40-hour credit class. They think they can get their real estate license. Boom, they're going to be a millionaire now. They don't return their phone calls. They don't return their emails. They don't tell their client they're going to do something and actually do it and get back to them. If you don't have communication, which unfortunately a large amount of people in our which industry Which is crazy don't, to me. Yeah. It's crazy. They, they, they cry that, oh, I don't got business. I don't got leads. But people are calling them or emailing them and they're not responding to them. So they won't make it. 
So I going back to ethics, I always tell someone. So uh, a lady told me the other day, you know, please look at look at this house like I was your sister. And I said, I would not only my sister, my mom. I said, I would not let you buy a house that I would not buy myself, that I would not sell to, you know, my mom. That, that's where the ethics comes in. So a lot of times, and I think you and me both deal with this a lot where we'll tell them, you know, I don't, I don't really feel comfortable in this situation with you buying this property with these terms, you know, with this. And we're okay with don't buy the house. That's okay. It's not the end of the world because that's how we got 93% repeat referral business. And it's 100%. You got to be a service provider and an advisor. We're advisors, like especially whether it's commercial or residential. If you don't want to buy the property, if you want to buy it, you're going to buy it. If it's time for you to move, whether it's commercial or residential, you're going to move. We're not selling you to move. We're advising you. When it's time to move, then we'll advise you on our experience and our professional opinion on what you should do and what our experience tells us. I agree with that 100%. you got to be a service provider. For sure. One of the greatest compliments I uh, have received often is that like, hey, Mike told us more properties not to buy than the ones he Which told is a us great compliment. Buy. And on that, it's, so it's a delicate balance of a lot of times our clients are going to want to purchase properties that maybe we might think other than, but that might be the match for them. You know, I'm not I'm not going to be the ultimate like uh, dictator of no, you're not buying it even though you love it and you want it. However, Agreed. I do become highly skilled at communicating them the areas of concern that I have that I want to make sure that they're aware of and then they can make their informed decision. Like you said, we're advisors because then if we did our job and they still move forward and say, no, we want to buy it. If for whatever reason those area of concerns did come up and are an issue for them, we actually discussed that with them and now we did a good service to them and then we can help get them out of that situation or that home that they should on a bar and we, we still work with them and we still, uh, still care for their best interest and help them as best as we can. They and, and that's how you don't lose a client because the salesperson is going to, oh, they want it? Great. Take it. I'm going to keep my mouth shut and I'm not going to disclose their concerns that I have. And then they're never going to get, they're never going to. Me have personally, that I again. wouldn't sleep. I wouldn't yeah. sleep. So it's not even about, of course, you want the client long term, but at the end of the day, you want to sleep good at night. For sure. You want to understand, like, there was a property that we had under contract I thought was a max at 525000 And I told him, hey, I think this is high end. They ended up going to market to, with the property. Someone else paid 500 almost 600000 and the person who bought the property called me, and I had no relationship with them. I never talked to them before this property. And they said, hey, uh, I, I bought this house. I really don't like it. I, I want to get out now. I said, okay, where's the property? I look it up. <clears throat> they tell me the address, and I seen what they bought it for. I didn't know it sold for that much. I said, oh, my God. In my head, I'm thinking, I had that under contract for 525 How did someone let you pay almost 600000 he said, it's been a nightmare. It's a disaster. But it goes to show you, you, you know, you got to do what's right. You got to put the commission last. That's the last thing we think about, you know. We had a, we had a talk the other day in training about how do you how do you how do you deal with buyer's remorse? There's a lot of that. A lot. The, right and, now. and the greatest de way to deal with buyer's remorse is you don't allow them to have it through proper uh, conversations prior to them making or accepting that all uh, that contract. So you, so you have to like, you have to express your concerns with them. If they're waiving a private inspection, you have to inform them that, look, you're, by doing this, you are going to help yourself get your offer accepted. However, you have to be willing to walk into a foundation that might have some water issues. You may have to be walking into a scenario where that roof might leak. And if, it, and if we do later find that out, are you okay with taking that upon yourself? And if I tell them that up front, then if it does happen, they're, they're not going to have buyer's remorse or they're not going to be worried about it after because it's already been disclosed to them. Like if you're OK with waiving the appraisal contingency and, you, and, and you're going to you're going to get your offer accepted at 550 and the property only appraises for 475. Are you OK with putting that additional down payment up front, knowing I'm going to stay in this home for five years, 10 years, 20 years, and it doesn't really matter? Have those additional conversations. Don't just tell them, well, the only way you're going to get it is if you do this. And then the combo's over. So, so, so again, it's understanding how to have high, 
level of skill conversations with your clients and advise them of what they're moving forward into. That was my question, by the way. I couldn't make it. You seen that? Uh, yeah. That was my question. Yeah, we talked about it. Yeah. That was a good one. You, you, you handled it up front. I couldn't make uh, the class, mm -hmm. but I was like, man, I got to hear about this because if 10 people are putting an offer, three of them are backing out, four of them are backing out, like before anything, before an inspection, before anything. But it, it's because too much of the pressure on the multiple offer situation is win, 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 which is good. We want to advise our clients how to win. Right. What also needs to be taken into the conversation is that happen. Okay, if and when we win, this is what we decided to do, and these are the potential consequences. Right. So if you have that conversation before they say, okay, go do it, you're not going to deal with buyer remorse. Right. It's all about being proactive, not reactive. Yep, exactly. One more question about uh, agents. Now, you, for 20 years, were a top listing agent. 25 years, however long you've been in the business. 25 years, you're a top listing agent. What is something you look for in another agent? to accept her offer, someone you want to work with. Are we talking about, so I'm a top listing agent you're the from, listing the, from agent. the buyer agent you, side? You're the listing agent, you got 10 offers. Yeah. What are you looking for from those 10 agents? Uh, organization and, yeah. the, and the offer submission package. Yeah. You know, I've always said, you know, I really love you to don't see. Like 10 different, uh, you don't like 10 different I, PDFs that you gotta click through and look through everything? No, um, I, I, I want them together, I want them organized, I want very neat paperwork. Yeah. Um, I wanna get on the phone with an agent who's already done their due diligence with their purchaser's pre-approvals, because pre-approvals are a dime a dozen. And, and I wanna be able to call that lender and or talk to the agent that, hey, we've already verified income, we ver we verified their tax returns. Not, oh, give me a minute, I gotta go look at it. Like, I'm gonna move on to the next one. Yeah. Uh, and, and then I, I want people, uh, look, everybody's gonna get the opportunity, even the newly licensed agent, but I really highly, highly value the agent's reputation of getting deals to the closing table. You know, I have a duty to provide to my clients on the list end that when we kind of advise them that this is the offer that we, we like and we support and we know can get to the closing sure table, will. Because a lot of money and a lot of anguish and time gets lost when you, as a listing agent, get a deal accepted that does not close. Yeah. Like we can't control that 100%. But through our experience and what we know and who we know and how we can decipher the good offers from the bad offers, is going to really dictate, you know, do we get smoothly to the closing table or not? And any property that comes back on the market is has a really hard time. I agree. I, I think uh, everything you're saying is 100%. One thing I look for to uh, go on, on top of your points, and I agree with everything you said, is the communication with another agent. Like you said, how they communicate, how they present the offer, their confidence, you know, but not overly confident, not cocky, but confident, if that makes sense. Um, I too on that note, you know, the, the for the past few years we've been in this multiple high offer highest and best era, you know, with this uh, sh uh, inventory shortage that we we've been seeing. Um, I I don't like agents to call me before they've even shown the property. I agree. I don't like agents to call me before they even submitted the offer. Like my advice to all real estate agents out there on behalf of your clients would be this. Go ahead and show the property before you call the listing agent. Write your best offer before you call the listing agent. Email it, submit it to the listing agent, and then call. 100%. And say, hey, I want to let you know I showed the property. My clients love it. We submitted it to you. And then from that point forward, you go, is there anything that, you know, you've seen my offer? Is there anything that this is in, in the seller's best interest that maybe we can sweeten up the offer a little bit to get the deal done? That I like. I, I don't like negotiating prior to you even wrote me anything. Take the time to write the effort, the, the offer, then make the phone call. I'm a it's it's kind of contrary to what a lot of people teach, but that's what I like because you can always revise, you can always adjust, and you know as a buyer agent when you're walking in to show on a property that's going to have multiple offers on it. Right. Get me the offer first. Now I know you and your clients are dead serious, then we'll talk. I like to not negotiate before uh, you show the house or before you write an offer, I 100% agree. Verbally negotiating is like going, 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 going nowhere fast. Pointless. It's Sick. beyond pointless. But I do sometimes like to call, not sometimes, usually all the time, call the agent and ask what's most important. What are they looking for? I don't want to say like, hey, if we bring you this, are you going to encounter? No. P, you know, understand what they're looking for so you come in strong from the beginning. That's, that's what we like to do. Uh, but at the end of the day, Everything you're saying is being proactive. 
and again, it seems like it doesn't make sense to ask that question after you write it. But the reason is, if you notice a lot of listing agents, when they, they're getting bombarded by so many phone calls, they actually get annoyed, yeah. right? Yeah. They, when you call them, they're really annoyed. Uh -huh. and, oh, you're just another one that's calling me and all these things. That's a good point. I, I think when you send like a great offer right off the rip and they see it in the box and you didn't call them, I just think you kind of like level up yourself um, amongst those other people of like, man, this guy's he's not a lot on me. He's not overbearing. He's submitted the offer. They're ready to go. Then you call and say, hey, the offer's in your box. Did you get a chance to look at it? And if there's anything I can do, because you can always make a quick revision. 100%. And that goes to not being like cocky and overbearing and aggressive. It's very, very like confident. Right. Here's the offer. Whether you call them before or call them after, that's actually it's, a great way to look at like it. It's like you've done it before. 100%. Where the agents 100%. who are calling, you can tell like almost again, they need that sale. They, yeah. They're really desperate for that sale. And again, they're nothing to that buyer agent. They're working hard for their client. I just think psychologically, and again, you asked me the question of me as a listing agent. When I see that agent gave it to me and they weren't blowing me up and, and calling me and they already took that step, for me, they kind of rank up. I agree. I agree 100%. Everything you're saying is from everything from a real estate agent so far has been being proactive. I think that's the key. So I think you're a very good uh, measure of success and a very good person at teaching others in the industry to be successful. And what I've gotten so far, which I kind of already know from being around you and being around this place, uh, and how I like to do my business as well, is be proactive. I really believe how you prepare is how you care. If you go eat, whether it's a showing, whether you talk to the whether you talk to the agent, whether the agent calls you after you send an offer, if you don't prepare, you really don't care. Yeah, for sure. You know, so I think that's uh, very big. My my man Abe Faraj, the the people's banker. That's you know, my Abe, guy. I told, called he, him yesterday. He, he said last week. He said the five P's of preparation. And he said poor preparation, uh, proper preparation prevents poor performance. He's amazing. Proper preparation prevents poor performance. 100%. I love that. It's so, funny. so yeah, you yeah. have to. I actually commented on his thing. But your, he said that your listing, your listing appointment is pretty much all preparation. All preparation. You know, the people, you know, we were having some of our newly licensed agents said, "Hey, like, how do I go on a listing appointment and win it?" When, when I don't have any experience. And the number one answer was be prepared. Be prepared, be prepared and then be confident. And if you're prepared, it's easy to be confident. 100%. So, so yes, for sure. I, um, you know, I, and, and then I really want to like share, if I can, the story about like why KW Legacy. And when I was on, when I was on my journey, uh, when I was on my journey at my other brokerage, a few things were I was observing and, and mostly it had to deal with me. I had to deal with all the mistakes that I was making and especially with money management and not understanding that we're business owners as real estate professionals and not understanding how to separate me, Michael Phillips, the individual from Michael Phillips, the real estate agent, as this is a personal life living expense and this is a business expense and this is a business investment and this is a business duty. And I was just, man, you know, I, like I said, everything was like, I would have success, I would earn income, then I would blow it and lose it all doing making bad decisions and bad moves. And I and I you know, I went through a cycle of making a lot of money, dead broke, making a lot of money, dead broke multiple times. The third time, I said that's enough. I said I'm learning from these mistakes. I'm going to make good decisions now. I went when I about when I turned 30 years old, I, I, I looked in the mirror one day and I was really disappointed in myself and and where I was at in my life and I said uh, I, I need to change. I'm going to make a change. And just how I was kind of had these bad habits, if you will, I got addicted to good habits. And that's when I started, you know, helping the community through youth sports and coaching Little League Baseball and to travel baseball and Little League football and to high school football. And when I look back on that, like that was God preparing me for what I do today. Mm -hmm. Because I, I not only I had to deal with the youth of the community and children and understand how to guide them, I had to deal with their parents as well. Why aren't they getting the ball? <laughs> Why aren't they yeah. in the game? I had to deal, you know. So like, so like when I when I look back on it, it was like God was preparing me for it. And now as I was going through that journey, what I was also doing in the real estate side inside of uh, my, my my brokerage was helping a lot of the, the real estate agents. You know, I went through the housing crisis. The housing crisis, looking back at it, was a lot of people's worst time. I found a way through seeking opportunity to make it one of my greatest times. 
Um, so, so in that time period, I started to grow my business and my business started to thrive. I started to invest in a few pieces of real estate. Um, I started teaching and training a lot of other realtors. And when I did, something lit inside of me that said, man, like I actually like helping. I like teaching. And I would, I started saving my money and I went to my broker at that time. And, you know, I offered like, can I buy in a little piece of this business and I'll help recruit and I'll help train agents, things that, that wasn't taking place at any other real estate brokerages. And, you know, that was his business and rightfully so. He wasn't interested at that. And I would keep recite coming back to him saying, hey, is there any opportunity for do, me to do this? Because I really love teaching. I love helping. I believe I can attract great talent. And it was just pushed away. And, you know, and, and a, a good story I have is my mom, uh, she used to come to all the travel baseball events with me and my boys. You know my mom very well, very active. And she always used to tell me, like, Ma, when are you going to open your own real estate company? And, you know, I would say, Ma, you know, when the time's right, like God's going to let me know. I'm going to just do my job and I'm going to prepare and I'm going to save my money. And when the time's right, like God's going to let, let me know. And sure enough, you know, I was so heavily invested with Steven and Mikey in sports. Then this minute Mikey was done with high school football, I get a call. And it's KW is looking to find an individual who might lead KW in Dearborn. And, you know, I raised my hand. I said, yeah. I'm interested. Yeah. And I, so I went to Northville. I met with this group. And right when I walked in, I seen on the wall over there, said, God, family, business. And right when I seen that, I'm like, man, th this is my place. Yeah. You know, this is, this is matches. Remember, we talked about value system. So we started having conversations with them. One thing started leading to another. There was one day right outside the window here. I remember I said, I told my mom when the time's right, like God's going to let me know. I was driving westbound on Michigan Avenue in military. at the light. I was all by myself. And a voice in my ear yelled, hey. And I, I looked left and it was this building. And then that voice in my ear said, that's your real estate company. And there was a for lease sign on the lawn. I wasn't turning left. I, I went and then made it and turned to left. I called that number. And right then and there, I started having the conversation with the lady about potentially taking this spot. And now I sit up front in that window every single day. Every day. And I, exactly like I told my mom, when the time's right, like God will let me know, like God let me know. Like I get goosebumps always when I think about that. And you know, so many things happened, you know, to where we're at today that, you know, there was a firm, firm opposition to the establishment of real estate brokerages in Dearborn yeah. that they didn't want this company here. Yeah. Because this company got announced as we're going to teach and we're going to train and we're going to help and we're going to do all these things that wasn't being done to the level that it's being done today. And my mission was not for this company. My mission was for all the companies in Dearborn to raise the bar. So I knew if, if, I, if I brought that here, then they naturally would have to raise the bar because... As real estate professionals, you can ask anybody who was in the industry from 2000 to 2020, what was the reputation of the Dearborn real estate agent outside of Dearborn? It was terrible. So one thing I wanted to mention was uh, the legacy of Color Williams' legacy and the legacy of this operation and your legacy. Two things I think that really changed the real estate in Dearborn uh, forever. The first thing is abundance, you know, thinking abundantly. I think here at this office, we're all happy for each other. We root for each other. You know, we, we are, we have the mindset that, uh, that just because Mike sells a house, I sell a house, this one sells a house, it doesn't affect any of us. Like the other day, <clears throat> me and you both were being considered for a uh, property and then they ended up listing with someone i, I didn't I, anyways they kind of ended up listing with someone else for like uh f i think a fraction of whatever but yeah. we we with the abundance mindset we weren't upset we laughed we laughed about it so i think one thing that legacy is spiraling and the energy that it's bring to the community is to be happy for one another you know and the amount of agents we have, how many agents are at Color Williams now? Today we have 166 agents. 166 agents still in, an, in a market where a lot of people are leaving the business. Right. 166 agents uh, shows the abundance, shows how fast it was done with you, Wael, in leadership, and how, you know, how we can all be happy for each other just because 166. 
it's agents. A, what can you say about abundance and why it's important both in business and in life? I would say two of the magic uh, powers in, in life that I've really gained an appreciation for in the past five to seven years. One is gratitude. You have to have gratitude. If you have gratitude, man, it's just magic that more and more good keeps coming your way. And, and abundance aligns with that. See, we, especially in our industry as 1099 independent contractors, if we don't get a contract in place, we're not getting paid, right? There's no commission coming from nothing. So, so it's very easy to have a scarcity mindset of, man, I, I don't have any deals or nothing is going to come. Instead of taking the mindset of, if I show up, and I do the good things, and I do what I'm supposed to do, and I return my phone calls, and I make my calls, unlimited amount of business is going to come my way because I'm good at what I do, and right. people love me. And like You have to talk to yourself like that, and it's very challenging. And the, the reason why I learned about those things is because I was one that struggled with them heavily, heavily. I had a really hard time of that. So again, going back to a little bit with education, you know, I started reading some books, and I started watching YouTube videos, I started meditating. I started doing yoga. I started doing all these things, incorporating them into what I call my diet yeah. of mental health. And that just unlocked power. And, and when I look back at the journey, the journey of legacy, I took the biggest financial risk that any, if, if people know exactly what I did with what I had at that time, they would think you're absolutely crazy. But I had no doubts in my mind that it was going to work in alignment with thinking in abundance, knowing that. I was going to give the gift to my community and to my city of education. And I, and I was going to be the person that I always needed in my life for everyone else that it, it's impossible to fail. Yeah. So, and, and because the journey that I went through, when we touched on it briefly about like not getting a formal education and doing those things, outside of these doors today, you know, if you took a hundred uh, high schoolers, there's going to be about 50 or 60 of them that are going to be in those exact same shoes that we were. Mm -hmm. What we built is, a, is an opportunity for them to become like us and hopefully better than us where they can learn to do things the right way. They can understand how business works. They can understand wealth building. They can be great human beings. And like you and I, like we, we, don't, we don't aspire to be wealthy so we can personally be wealthy. We want to be wealthy so we can help so many people and change so many lives. Like that's what KW Legacy is. For sure. Majority, not all, majority of all real estate brokerages out there, they're only going to talk about one thing, and that's sales. Right. You take a listing, you make a sale. You take a listing, you get a buyer sale. You take a listing, you make a sale. That's it. That might account for 20% of our training in here because yes you need to have that income stream so now we can do start doing so many other incredible things what are some of the i remember we uh from color williams giving back uh is a very big thing here we donated i believe fifty thousand dollars color williams legacy did in 2023 what were some of the things that was donated to we're very, very active in giving back uh, for, to the schools. Okay. Any school organizations that call. Majority of the, the donations that we give, by the way, we don't even announce. We don't need being broadcast, but like all the schools around here know you need anything. Dearborn, Dearborn Heights schools, you, you call KW Legacy and they're going to. A lot of them are going to see this and, and they're going to call. And they're going to give. We, we love that. We have no problem with that. We help with the city. We help yeah. with the city, any you know type of parks, anything that the city might need. We're always there for them. We're very active with the churches and mosques of Dearborn. If they, the religious groups need any help and any, any support, they know they can count on us. Uh, throughout the year, we'll have many you know situations that come up that are um, uh, maybe some type of uh, tragedy or some bad scenario has taken place that the families need support. We're always there for them, and we want to be called on for those things. But the best uh, thing is, sorry to cut you off, but the best one was, in my opinion, was it's not only local. Color Williams, we, you know, Color Williams Legacy in particular helps. One of them was nationwide. We built the well. I don't know. I yeah, think we have the water well in Yemen. In Yemen. Built, yep. What? How many people does that affect? How long? I mean. I, I, I have no idea, but I know that the total project, I believe, was $20,000. Wow. And, you know, hopefully, and God willing, it's helping out a lot of people, which I'm sure it is. That's amazing. Yeah. So the, we get to give back, and uh, whether it's coaching or, you know, all the 
monetary things that Keller Williams does as a company, one of the things that uh, allows that to happen, and one of the things that, um, the, the second thing I wanted to say was that was going back was Keller Williams' legacy and your legacy is uh, big business. Before uh, Keller Williams' legacy, you really only thought when it's a real estate agent, you just think of anywhere else. It's just a real estate agent. They make a great living. They sell a few properties. And what Keller Williams did and what Keller Williams' legacy started, before Keller Williams' legacy started, how many teams were at Keller Williams? I mean, in Dearborn. Just one. Just one. It, it was Yeah, Dave Abdullah's team was the only one. And I think maybe he had himself and uh, his brother Al and a couple other agents. And he was the only one that was operating any sort of semblance as a, as a, of a team. Yeah, and what Keller Williams does, and we when we go to these uh, these seminars and to Austin, which I love going, it's amazing, and they really emphasize being owning a big business and having a team and growing a team, and it's never about money and making millions and a billionaire and how much. It's all about living a better life. Yep. It's about leveraging, like. In the past three weeks, I was in Florida for two weeks. If you, if I was just a regular real estate agent that didn't leverage, and going back to like money, like you probably make less money, which is fine, but you live a better life. You have more time. You have more time. Yep. And that's your your, so, your greatest commodity. I, I always think with these types of like these these pictures and these visions, and I always see the when we work, I relate that to the the mouse and or the hamster and the hamster wheel. And, and the hamster is running and it's spinning that wheel and that's us as we work. And then if I took that hamster and I moved him out, that wheel is going to eventually stop, right? Well, when we want to take ourselves out, we want that wheel to keep going. And the only way we do that is by we find incredible people like some of the individuals you have on your team and we create them opportunities for them now. It's their time. You guys thrive and you get it going and we win and we always win together. Mm-hmm. And, and so that's what team building is, and that's what we teach. And Because, again, you want to live the greatest life through real estate. You don't want to be a great real estate professional, and then you stop, and now your income has stopped, and you know hopefully you made an outstanding investment and did whatever you've needed to do. That's why we teach investing as well uh, and wealth building through real estate. So when you do want to take yourself out of that, um, your income is still going to thrive. Right. Again, not only are you going to go live that greatest life through real estate, but then for me in particular, I'm passionate about how many people can I help. My duty on my duty, I believe, why I was we were brought to this planet by God, is to make it and leave it a better place than we found it. So I'm going to do every single thing that I can. Like through this company, actually, I found my big why. Big why I always thought, it's like, yeah, my kids, well, I have children, so yeah. they're my big why. They're the reason why I do everything. I think genetically, that's normal. All of us should have that. Like, if you have children, genetically, you should care for that child, want to do good for it. Right. That's not really your big why. That's, right. how, that's how your DNA code says you should be. My big why is to be a 1% better version of myself each and every single day in all aspects of life for all of humanity. See, my big reason is not just for me. It's for, the, it's for the person walking down the street when I leave here today that I might meet. Am I going to make a positive impact on that person's life? Potentially, if they need me, I'm ready for that. Yeah. So so that that's what makes me get out of bed every day and just keep you know coming forward to do what I need to do. So it kind of puts the two things in perspective here at Color Williams Legacy. The two things that really have changed the real estate industry locally is having a big business and growth and leverage and also abundance, knowing that you can't be at every showing, you can't go on every listing appointment, but it's good. You train others not only to be as good as you, but to be better than you. <clears throat> Everyone has time. So not only like if you go out of town for a week or two, if someone on your team goes out of town for a week or two, or someone in your brokerage goes out of town for a week or two, they just, someone else steps in. And we have an abundance mindset that like, in another, in a real world brokerage or in a different brokerage, you know, you might have that scarcity mindset that I have to be there. Or what if this person takes my client? Or what if they don't do it as good as me? But when you have the abundance mindset on top of the big business, it's... Scarcity mindset is good for brokerages to keep their people. They don't want their people thinking big. They don't want their people thinking in abundance because they're afraid that their people might grow bigger than them. 
my duty here is to teach and to hope and pray that, that our people get bigger than me. My duty then is to only hope I can grow a world that they can stay in where we stay in business together in some way, shape, form, and or capacity. Let's use us for example. I don't look at you anymore for a long time. I haven't as just like he's a real estate professional. He's somebody that I might be business partners with in many type of type of ventures and somebody I would love to be in business with. And I believe you feel vice versa, same I do. with me. So so that's the thing. Many other businesses, uh, brokerages, they want to keep their people thinking only sales. Because the minute you become really wealthy and you're not so dependent only on sales, the lesser of a connection that brokerage has to that agent in their mind. That's scarcity. When you think abundance, you think, hey, I'm, we're just going to keep doing this together and we're going to grow big. And hey, look, if anybody says, like, I can find, I clearly understand what the value proposition of KW Legacy is. And I know what KW Legacy's value is to all individuals. If any individual thinks that they can replace that value anywhere else, for any amount of money or, or lack of cost to them, I wish them the best of luck. I love them all and I wish them the best of luck because I know the value that Legacy provides. 100%. So one time, we, one of the times we went to Austin, Texas, Keller Williams, like, Keller Williams in general, how many agents are at Keller Williams? 170,000. 170,000. So we're sitting in a room with, I believe it was like 200 people mm -hmm. and Gary Keller was in there who was the CEO of 170,000 people, whatever it is. And he was late. He was five minutes late. And he said, uh, sorry, guys, I apologize. I was sitting with a potential agent who's considering coming to Keller Williams. And he so when you think of like a big company like that, you think of like a Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk, not that Keller Williams is as big as that, but like you can't talk to them or you want to kind of want to understand what those conversations are like. And Gary Keller said, so I was talking to this individual who makes 17 million a year in commission. And I'm like, you think, like, what the 17? Like, not only that's the CEO, this guy is how much, how many homes, how many properties he's on? What's the, you know? So he said, and he broke down the conversation. He gave us some insight. He said, uh, this guy was going to go to a different brokerage and they made him promises. And when it came to signing the documents, everything they promised had changed. And he said, this was our first meeting. And uh, he said, and out of the first, this was the first time we met with them. We scheduled a meeting for a few weeks and we said, hey, look, here's what we could do for you. Here's what, you know, how we can help you. And maybe you can come here. Maybe you can't. It was very casual. And it shows you like conversations, whether you're talking to someone who does one deal or the 17 million in commission, it's if you find value somewhere else, then go there. That's fine. It's all good. You know, and, and that energy is, I think, what we keep uh, for our clients, for our coworkers, for our uh, for a deal for 100000 or a deal for $5 million. It's very casual. We provide a value, and we know what value we provide. And if you feel like you can get something better elsewhere, that's, that's all good. Yeah, I, you know, I think we've both learned that the, the lesson now. Uh, we're at earlier stages in our career that m the importance of money uh, is uh, is so is substantially greater than we, we the understanding that I really want to live a fulfilled life, and and because then once you start having the the money where money is not the main objective anymore and it's not the main concern because I have bills to pay, I've kind of graduated through that. I understand now that I want to be surrounded by the right people, the right environments, the right values so I can be fulfilled and knowing that I'm actually doing good in this world. Again, all comes back to culture. Like, who are you with? So those top producers like that you're talking about, they're not lo necessarily looking for a deal that's going to put more money in their pocket. They have plenty of money. Right. It's where are they going to feel that they match and they're fulfilled with. So it's 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 an alignment of who I'm in business with, to me, who I'm in business with significantly matters. And that's why I actually carry that sign because we can take, we can take the KW sign off the building and it can just stay, say legacy real estate. And I believe we're not going to lose one agent. I agree. So I stay in business with them because of the human beings that they are, the people that they are, the values. I wanted to touch back real quick on what's changed in Dearborn real estate market since KW legacy has been involved. So we kind of talked about raising the bar one, of training. 
So now across the board, you're going to see the rest of the brokerages talk about training, how much of them actually do it. They find out, man, that's that's a lot of work, you know, unless I was actually like we are inspired to create a company that trains and teaches. So we love doing it. It doesn't feel like work to us. Others have to be like, man, this is a lot of work Two, social media marketing on behalf of the brokerages for their people. Prior to KW Legacy being involved, it was something that I was really passionate about because when you know when I would have success at my prior brokerage, if I wasn't going on Facebook and marketing it my my own success, which I don't really like doing, yeah, it was never being done. And I so I always said, man, I, I want to create a brokerage that celebrates our people and celebrates their successes on behalf of them. So when we started doing it, everyone started doing it. That's good. Everyone wins. Professional photography and social media marketing of listings. Prior to us doing it at KW Legacy and raising the bar and hiring professional phot photographers and drone footage for our listings, used to be rare in Dearborn. It used to be all iPhone, click, 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 and the pictures go into the MLS, and, and there you go. We raised the bar there because if you're... Your competitors see that they're gonna copy you know and they should nowadays if you don't i mean i agree <clears> that <throat> times have changed and color williams like it has a lot to do with it if you don't take professional pictures which sometimes it's still not done which is the craziest thing to me and then sometimes they're very nice properties if you're not going to professionally photograph it take drone f footage even nowadays you know make some type of professional video you're really doing a disservice to your client for sure you know you got to invest they're paying you a commission yet you have to invest that money back into the business into their property into the advertising yeah you know we're, we're baffled sometimes when we think like man why did the seller hire this professional who's not doing any service it's for terrible. their listing and sometimes the seller speaking of scarcity sellers have that scarcity mindset say well hey if i just pay this person one percent then you know they're i'm gonna actually save money well you're actually gonna lose if they're not providing the value that a top tier listing agent provides um so th you know that's a whole nother conversation you get what you pay for if someone's yeah. gonna pay one percent or less or if someone's gonna discount their commission in their brokerage's commission, they're gonna discount they want, yours. They're gonna discount for sure. the, the three, four, five hundred thousand dollar property. They're gonna, they're gonna be looking for the quick, quick sale. Get it done, get it over with, and let's move on. Instead of making sure my client is getting top dollar for their property. And a lot of times, those quick sales don't close. Yeah, a lot of times those quick sales don't close. Uh, Mike, as we wrap up, is there any wise words? Because you asked me, is there people? Is there people who watch the whole podcast? They do so. At the end of this podcast, people are going to want to hear some last wise words. What do you have for the people? I'll start with this. In anything that you do in life, there is no such thing as failure. One of two things is going to happen. Anytime I set out on an objective, I'm either going to achieve that objective. So let's if we relate it to real estate, if I'm going on a listing appointment, I'm going to get the listing appointment achieved, right? Or I'm not going to get it but I'm going to learn a very valuable lesson. You have to value them the same. You don't come back negative thinking, man, I didn't get that listing up. Uh, uh, I didn't get that listing appointment. I lost. You think I gained. I won incredible experience and knowledge for the next one. 100%. They're both extremely valuable. One, sometimes the commission you might make from getting that listing, the lesson you learned is more valuable than the commission that you earned. 100%. So you're always learning. Yeah, everything is a win. It's either I learned something or I achieved my result. That's a, that's advice I would love to give to everybody. That's great advice. That's phenomenal advice. There's no such thing. There's nothing ever that you go through that you can't learn from. Nothing ever. Impossible. A deal doesn't go through, whether it's personal, business, 100%. Those are actually great wise words to end. Whatever happens, whatever happened, even this morning, you can learn from it. Yeah. Whatever it is. You level up. You know, the way I can, I, I still talk to the kids and I have a nine-year-old and everything that he does, like uh, yesterday was his first golf tournament. So he started having a couple of struggles. I'm like, you're just gaining XP. You know, XP is the experience. Like when they play these role-player games or the Fortnite and they're gaining XP, I'm like, you're just getting XP. You're just gaining, you know, you're getting better and you're improving and you're learning. So you just, you gain that XP, you just keep rolling through life, just adding up experiences, adding up knowledge. And you know, you just the, the thing that you have to do is you have to do something. 
You have to commit to something. You have to take those steps forward. We talked about the law of abundance. The law of abundance doesn't work if you don't take any steps towards it. And then once you take those steps forward, you know, the laws of the universe, the universe are going to take effect and what you put out is going to come back to you. You are the prime example of that. You know, I talk to you about, um, all the time. You're one that has come here. You've picked up on these small tidbits and you've just implemented them into your life. And man, you're just blossoming and blossoming. And, and, I, and I'm sure along the line there you take your little bumps in the road or your little dips and you just chalk them up as learning experiences and you just keep improving through them. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. I'm proud of you and I appreciate you. Thank you. To end on your last point that you just made, abundance works, but you have to do something. You have I, to. I'm big on writing things down. Mm -hmm. And I write down like, so for example, I have someone who I need to find this specific business for. So I have some books where I will write down what I'm going to do and I'll write it down a hundred times and I'll look at it every day until I do it. Now, if I just did that and waited for someone to call me, nothing would happen. But if you think abundantly, you think of what's positive, you write it down, look at it, write it down, look at it. But in the middle of every day doing it, you call and look and search and drive around, it's going to happen. So if you put together abundance and doing the work, and thinking positively and doing the work and knowing it's going to happen, then you will accomplish whatever you want to accomplish. For sure. Sure. The brain the brain is an incredible uh, the device, if you will. We're only figuring out small, small pieces of how it operates, but those are little uh, uh, tasks, if you will, that you're doing, that you're keeping what you want to attract in your brain front and center. So when a call comes in or an opportunity presents itself that otherwise your brain might not pick up yep. because you're not tuned in, you grab it. 100%. And then you make it come to life. 100%. Mike, thank you for joining us. Thanks for the beautiful room that you built here. And thanks for Keller Williams' legacy. Anytime. Thank, thank you. you, Mike. Yep. Thank you for joining us on episode five of the Realtors Roundtable. If you haven't subscribed yet, please subscribe. We'll catch you on the next one.